trust the process, have faith. I mean, well, and then the second, the second part of that would be don't give up. You can't, you you can't give up. I mean, like I said, this is my journey. Who would have picked it? But if you give up, you'll never know what your journey is. That was Rob Coble, and this is the Share Podcast. It's time for the Share Recovery Podcast, where we bring you amazing life-changing success stories from addicts and alcoholics all over the world who share their inspiring journey in recovery. And now, here's your host, O. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Share Podcast, and today we have Rob Coble joining us on the show. And Rob was an Emmy Award winning investigative reporter. He had everything a man could imagine, a dream job, a beautiful wife, but in the background was an alcoholic. When his ex-wife, a CNN news anchor, writes a tell-all book about their marriage and goes on a book tour promoting it, he has a very public and embarrassing meltdown. Rob is caught on a mall security camera, wasted, taking a leak on the Apple Store. The arrest makes headlines across the country. Four years later, Rob is sober and on a mission to put purpose and passion back into his life. Still unhappy after trying jobs in different careers, he moves 2,000 miles out west to Los Angeles in hopes of getting a second chance at what he loves to do, meeting and sharing the stories of others. On his journey, he reconnects with old friends and meets new ones who share their stories about how they have or are trying to pick up the pieces of their lives. Today, Rob takes us through his story, the battle with drugs and alcohol, the wreckage it caused in his life, and his journey into recovery up until today. So let's dive into Rob's story. But first, if you have not yet rated and reviewed the Share Podcast, please, one of the best ways to help support the show is to go to iTunes, leave us a five-star rating and a review, and that helps catapult us up the ratings on iTunes, which will make it easier for more and more people to find the Share Podcast. Now, in the past, many of you have asked, hey, oh, how can I help support the show? Well, I'm going to keep it simple for you. First, I want to thank the people who have sent us donations via PayPal. There are a few of you that still continuously send donations on a monthly basis, but we can always use more. So on a weekly basis, I have over 5,000 listeners every week who listen to the Share Podcast. So if 100 of you guys would send me five bucks a month, that would completely support the show from beginning to end. So for those of you who have the wherewithal to send me five bucks, either PayPal or by Patreon, then please feel free to do so. We could really use the support. Also, when you're purchasing stuff on Amazon, there are those of you that are still clicking on the Amazon link on the Share Podcast website before doing their purchases on Amazon. But again, there are thousands of you listening. If each and every one of you could just remember to go to the Share website, click on the Amazon button before you do your shopping, that is also going to make a tremendous difference for us financially. So I haven't been one to emphasize it in the past, right? But now we've got a solid listener base. I know you guys love the show. I know you guys get a lot out of it. There are those of you just like in the meetings that are newcomers, the money's tight. Keep listening. The show will always be for free. The Share Podcast private accountability group will always be for free. But for those of you who can, kick in a couple of bucks. Help us out here. And not to forget the Share Podcast private accountability group. Again, it's growing like crazy. Guys, go to the Share Podcast, www.thesharepodcast. Click on the button that says join the Facebook private group. For those of you that are in the private accountability group, you know how vital and important that has become. There's over 1,500 members in there. If you don't want to go to meetings, if you have problems connecting with people, if you need something more than just the podcast and are not ready to cross over into meetings or some other structured program, then the private accountability group is perfect for you. Jump in there, make comments, ask questions, or just read the posts. There are so many people out there that have the same questions that you have. All you have to do is just read those and then read all the follow-up answers and responses that come. And make sure to subscribe to my weekly newsletter so you know every single time a brand new episode is launched. And of course, if you have any questions, just email me, o at thesharepodcast.com, and I'll get back to you as soon as possible. So now a quick message from our sponsors, and then on to the show. Would you like to join a free, anonymous online group that offers a daily topic email with popular recovery resources accompanied by a secret Facebook group for discussion? 
Then go to dailyaaemails.com for more information about Transitions Daily. And don't forget to share dailyaaemails.com with friends, in meetings, and with sponsees in recovery. Sober Nation is the largest online recovery community and treatment resource center. They provide treatment resources to those struggling with addiction, as well as to the family members who are caught in the crossfire. On top of that, Sober Nation is a huge community of good people who share their experience with each other. They have informative content, recovery and addiction news, as well as an entire clothing line which helps expand the culture of recovery. They can easily be found at www.sobernation.com. Sober Nation is putting recovery on the map. Hey, Robert, thanks for joining us. Hey, oh, thanks for having me, man. It's great to be here. I'm excited to have you in the show, buddy. How are you feeling today? I am feeling good on a rainy, cold Southern California day. It sort of feels more like Seattle, but uh, <laughs> I'm feeling good. I miss Cali so much. But you don't miss this weather. You're in Costa Rica, man. You're living the life. La Vida Loca. At least, uh, at least us in recovery now, La Vida Loca. Well, most people, most people will agree California's got some of the best weather in the world as well. It just so happens it that today is, today is not cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, we've had a, a couple of weeks that have been tough, but, you know, the sun will be back out. Yeah, oh, no, absolutely. And then you'll have that beautiful California sun. What part of California? Uh, Southern California, right in the uh, San Fernando Valley. So I'm in Van Nuys uh, area. Oh, man, yep, yep. Bringing oh, back no. memories? Even lots, lots. I used to live in Studio yeah. City. You know, oh, I, yeah. I lived in Glendale, Van Nuys. I've lived <laughs> all over L.A. for a while, man. <laughs> No, you've I, I, been there oh yeah 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 no i go back once a year to visit my sister she's still out there so uh yeah no cool. love california and i love costa rica what can i say i'm blessed oh yeah i don't blame <laughs> you i've been there once i uh, went to uh, mount arenal i was at the house springs that is a cool place i want to go back sometime soon oh arenal is just spectacular yes it's awesome and i and i and I, you can tell i'm not local my espanol is uh, muy malo for the most part but uh <laughs> I, I was able to uh order a whopper with cheese at the airport but i got frustrated and i had to say como se dice como se dice cheese cheese and which queso i finally i should have remembered that come on you got it easy. you got it yeah <laughs> they all screamed it at me because i was holding up the line <laughs> yeah you know, most people speak english here so you know that's the it's true that's a good part they wanted to make me sweat <laughs> absolutely all right folks well today we have robert coble joining us on the share podcast and robert was an emmy award-winning investigative reporter and lost everything he had in less than an hour he was arrested drunk pissing on the apple store and was caught on camera the arrest came on the heels of his wife of his ex-wife a CNN news anchor writing a tell-all book about their marriage and divorce. She had been promoting the book for the past six months, and it was finally her interview with Dr. Drew that pushed him past the breaking point. Sounds like one hell of a story that you're about to tell us, Robert. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I sort of, you know, it's been like four years, and when you bring that back up, I still get a little bit, man, it brings me back to that night, and that was a... That was a tough night. But, you know, again, it, you know, it changed my life. And, you know, it, it took a little while. But, you know, uh, I'm very appreciative of, of that uh, broadcast with uh, my ex-wife, Christy, and, and Dr. Drew. But it took me a while to be able to say that. Long time. Oh. Resentments. Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, and there's nothing you can do about it because I was caught on tape. <laughs> oh, yeah, you know, and that's the irony. When I went to treatment, they said, you know, I got to laugh at this. One of my counselors, and I said, why, why are you laughing at this? And he's like, well, the guy that uses these tools to catch people. People, you got caught with the very yep. tools that you use and the irony. And I'm like, okay, I get it. You got a good point. But right now it's not funny. <laughs> but they said I would laugh eventually and that the story would, would help a lot of people. And that's, you know, really what, you know, I, I spend time, you know, trying to do prevent, prevent, you know, late night shopping at Apple stores and prevent people from losing uh, marriages, lives, jobs, their life. And, Absolutely. And, you know, well, we're going to definitely dive into that and to more detail. Uh, but first, let's talk a little bit about what your life is like today. So what does your normal daily routine look like? And what does your recovery routine look like? 
Yeah, it's uh, it's wild. I'm out here in uh, Southern California, and every day is a little bit different. Uh, right now, I've been uh, doing some producing and acting, so uh, the days range. If you know, I'm headed to a set. Sometimes that call time is you know 4:30 in the morning. Other days, I you know I don't have any work. So, being a person in recovery uh, is very important for me to uh, try to stay on a schedule as much as I possibly can. Uh, especially start out the day maybe with some meditation or just even quiet time for myself. Um, you know, get a get my head on straight and some good focus, you know, on what I want to accomplish in that day. Yes. And, uh, you know, keep, uh, keep very, very, you know, straight laced and, and, you know, on a path, on a mission a little bit. So when I'm doing those kind of things, you know, um, they're long days, 14, 15 hour days. If you're on a set other days, you know, it's, uh, it's very, you know, uh, it's boring. So I got to go work out. Uh, and I need to be more religious on those things, you know, attend meetings. I'm in Southern California where I think we got about 2000 meetings a week and i'm so grateful for that because there's all different kinds and you know so i try to you know balance that knowing that you know balance for me is probably the most important thing that that keeps me sober not too many highs not too many lows and uh you know keeping out of my own head yeah no absolutely now you said earlier before we started the interview you have two movies that you've been working on uh, one is called Leap, and the other one is called Chasing Evil, and those are coming out right soon. Yeah, yeah, they're hitting the. Uh, what what happens typically is they'll hit the film festivals, which uh, I know Chasing Evil is out doing that. I think Leap is on its way. Uh, they uh, you know circulate to wherever those are you know submitted to you know pick up distribution and stuff. So uh, I have not seen the final cut of either one of them. So I hope that they're good, but uh, you know it was it was certainly uh, I, you know I'm, I'm pretty you know positive and uh, excited you know about both of them, but um, they were very different to do, but both you know centered around recovery, which was very important. Leap uh, is a story of uh, four people that uh, are followed for a year and are giving some of the world's best life coaches. If you remember, you know John Gray, women are from Mars, men are from Venus. I always screw that yes. up, so I, I may have done that. But uh, Jack Canfield, Chicken Noodle Soup for the Soul. Mm -hmm. uh, John D. Martini was a guy I really liked a lot. Uh, there's a bunch of them. Um, we're each each of us got about six or seven coaches, and we had different categories. And mine was the life category, where you know you screwed up your life, and we're going to help you. And uh, the other ones were relationship. Uh, one was a small business, and one was an on, and one was more of a larger business type thing. So we each had our own um, you know journeys. I actually gave up my job, sold my Emmy award, and moved out to Southern California to you know begin a new life and chase my dreams. And then while I was out here, we happened to uh, Chasing Evil is the story of Robbie Knievel, Evil Knievel's son, and how he's trying to keep the family name alive, uh, keep it the most famous on two wheels, but also his journey into sobriety. Uh, Robbie, no secret, has you know struggled with uh, alcohol addiction you know, all of his life, you know, just like his dad. And uh, when we caught back up, it would have been years since we'd seen each other, and I, he was close to a year sober, and I had about three at that time. So they asked me to be part of the film and talk about the days where, yes, where we partied together and <laughs> it was crazy times before he jumped the rooftops of the Grand Canyon but then also sort of share what it takes uh, you know to, to be sober and and how we achieve that on a day-to-day -day basis and you know Robbie going back into the same things uh, he did a sober jump in Palm Springs that's you know part of the film about a year ago now you're in LA so there's tons of meetings out there right Tons, tons. And, you know, it's, and I love it because, you know, whether you're down on Sunset Boulevard, you know, the Rainbow Room, I, I can list them all off. And, uh, heck, we even have uh, meetings. I've had some on sets that I work on, you know, inadvertent that happen where we just find out there's other people in recovery. And we start, you know, uh, chatting a little bit, checking on each other. And uh, that's great. Uh, that's an important part. Uh, my recovery has always been uh, the rooms are not my destination. Uh, you know, it's a vehicle, you know, for me to, to explore my life, but I've got to take that with me and I've got to drive in that car or, you know, I'll be in, I'll be pissing on the Apple store again, maybe something worse. <laughs> you know, we don't, and I don't want to do that again. No. Down that, I know how that movie ended. <laughs> well, and well, it's true. <laughs> it's, it's true. And I'm, I'm envious of the, of, of the meetings because, you know, being in Costa Rica, English speaking meetings are limited. We do have some great meetings. So I'm absolutely grateful for the ones that we have. But when I'm in L.A., there is absolutely no shortage of meetings anywhere. It doesn't matter where I'm at in California. I can just Google the city yep. I'm at and an AA meeting and boom, you know, yep. uh, here you go. And, and one every hour. 
Yeah, yeah, and I find them, you know, so forgiving, uh, so welcoming, um, so different from the other places. I got sober in the Deep South down in uh, Greensboro, North Carolina, and I certainly faced my challenges. Limited meetings, uh, they were English-speaking, although the southern draws could get a little bit uh, confused, along with probably my Yankee accent, but not as bad as Costa Rican <laughs> Spanish. But, uh, you know, I'm really grateful. I, I didn't realize how strong the recovery community is out in Southern California, and I think, you know, anybody can find their niche. And to me, that's what it's really important about is, you know, hey, you better have a plan. You better have your own recovery plan, however that works, however it may look for you, but you better find it. Yes, absolutely. You know, and I, I don't push, you know, if people find it and, and it's working for them, that's good. And, you know, if, if it's not, then you're going to have to tweak it. You're going to have to figure out ways. And, and that's, you know, what I do on a day-to-day, day-to-day basis, too. I'm not perfect, you know, for it, and I could be a lot better. Yes, we all could. All right, and that's the whole. That's the point of all this. It's there. Yeah. There really isn't a, 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 a final destination. You know, recovery is all about the journey, and the journey just uh-huh. continues. Right? Oh, because- that's so true. I mean, that's, that's, you know, and I always thought, you know, it's a destination and and you're right. I think that's something that, you know, I was like, well, I'll get here and this will be it. This will be perfect. No, the best way to explain it, it's the journey. Absolutely. No question about it. So on this journey, how much clean time do you have and when is your anniversary date? Anniversary date is September 22nd, 2012. So pushing, coming close to four and a half years. Very grateful for that. Um, for me, it's, you know, not drinking and, and using is, is probably not the hardest thing. You know, I guess I'm blessed in that aspect. You know, there's that obsession, you know, really, you know, was lifted after pissing on the Apple store and being embarrassed and, you know, really hurting a lot of people too and, you know, uh, disappointing your family and stuff. So I think, you know, for me, that really drove it home. But I think as anybody would say that's in recovery, you know, man. Man, it's the hardest part sometimes is just living life. Absolutely. That it's the day to day thing. We don't realize that we use the drugs and alcohol as the solution for all of our problems, our personal mm-hmm. problems, our financial problems, our emotional problems. Mm-hmm. Then without them, we still have them. So we have to yeah. develop all these coping skills yep. and and um, principles and values and I mean they set limits and boundaries and oh yep. like before you know oh. it's like, I didn't know what, I didn't know it was going to be all this <laughs> yeah I was like wait a second I thought uh, read this book go to meetings and not drink you know it was going to be all of it oh no that's not in the beginning of it but like you said you know it's really you know for for me and probably a lot of other people it's uh, you know I'm living a life I'm I'm not even really uh, relearning. I'm learning. And that's probably the hardest thing is now I have to sit in my own emotions. I have to, you know, identify when things aren't going well and and not fall back into old patterns and and, and teach myself. But, you know, you know, a little uh, about four and a half years now, it's weird. It's funny how I can see, hey, yeah, your your mind is not thinking in the right place again. So what I say a lot is, you know, trust the process and have faith. And, you know, I I think of the serenity prayer an awful lot because that's really just sums sums it up for me, you know, very simple. Absolutely. No question about it. So, Rob, tell us about the first time you drank or used drugs. And more importantly, how did they make you feel just that first time? Yeah. So, you know, it probably goes back to high school, maybe around 14, 15 years old. I was growing up in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And, um, you know, we uh, uh, we got some beer and we got somebody older to buy it or something like that. And, you know, I, I didn't like it at first, but I liked the feeling. You know, because I felt that feeling that, you know, uh, he gave me the boost of confidence. Uh, I thought it was more charming and I was maybe for a little bit and, you know, gave me the, you know, I'm a pretty shy guy, believe it or not. And, you know, gave me that boost of confidence around women, you know, around friends. And, you know, I I don't want to say bulletproof, but I think I put a swagger in my step. (laughs) <laughs> and, uh, you know, it was it was cool. But that swagger, you know, it's people, you know, that are probably prone to addiction. I have it on both sides of my family. Didn't take me long before, you know, uh, I was a uh, senior in high school and I backed into the Ann Arbor police uh, squad car drunk. Oh, and there you go. I mean, so, yeah, you know, before, you know, I'm really even get out of the gates. I'm in deep shit, you know, and you just go, (laughs) you know, and, you know, you're a senior. So I think parents are thinking a little bit, you know, everybody's like, oh, this is not good. This is not great. But, you know, you're going off to college and, you know, it sort of just, you know, fades, fades. I mean, trust me, everybody was upset and and worried and, you know, and and I was too and should have been more aware of it. But, you know, I don't think you catch it. You sort of, you know, chalk it up to, okay, that's the age. But it really isn't because nobody else was doing that. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> I was paving the way and not the way I should be. Oh, no question about it. All right, Robert. Well, listen, you're all warmed up, buddy. So it's time for me to turn this show over to you. It's time for you to share your story, the battle against drugs and alcohol, the wreckage it caused in your life, when you hit rock bottom, and finally your journey into recovery up until today. So, Robert, take it away. Okay, well, jump in, too. Oh, I don't want to drone on and bore you, so jump no, in anytime. Don't worry. But, uh, I'll be in there. <laughs> okay, thanks, man. But uh, so that was, you know, really uh, at 14 years old is, you know, where I started uh, drinking. And uh, like I said, you know, quickly uh, should have identified other problems. I think it was eight months after that I went off to the University of Tampa, and uh, I was arrested for disorderly conduct. Uh, somebody had pulled a fire alarm, and uh, we were all out drinking. They you know, evacuated the, the dorm, and after a while, it was cold. Even in Tampa that night, it was cold. And I tried to force my way past the cops to go back through and uh, ended up getting arrested for that. They found a fake ID. And, you know, it was just those things that you, know, you really just – I don't know, our red flag is right from the start. You know, it's just eight months later after, you know, another arrest. But uh, that was always sort of the story of my uh, using uh, predominantly alcohol. Of course, when I was drunk, I tried other things too. But uh, the alcohol gave me that boost, and it worked for a while. It gave me that boost to pick up women. It gave me that boost of confidence to, you know, not be shy around a group of people. And, uh, you know, I found out later it wasn't something that you always needed. But uh, for me, uh, it was the secret. And like I said, you know, it worked for, you know, quite a while. Then I transferred up to University of Florida, uh, Bill Gators, and you know, the, in Gainesville, Florida. And uh, the drinking continued. I mean, there was no doubt. It was a lot of my drinking in the early days was you know, party hard, work hard. Uh, school was a lot more of a challenge that that at that time. And um, yeah, I had some run-ins with the cops up there. Um, I was a journalism major at University of Florida, and um, I was always sort of lucky or unlucky, if you if you if you want to point it out that way. And I think uh, <laughs> sometimes it was the unlucky lucky part, uh, or, you know, it turned out lucky. It happened to be one time I did a student project ride along with a cop and, uh, it was a couple months later that, uh, he pulled me over and uh, I was, I was really, really drunk. And, uh, he was like, Hey, do you remember? And I'm like, yeah, officer Lee. And he's like, yeah, you were coming from this direction. And I'm like, no, that way. And he goes, no, you weren't. You know? So he called a couple fraternity brothers of mine and he goes, look, and I know Rob, he's a good guy. That's why I'm letting him off. So it was always little things like that, right? you know, and it, you know, continued on. And I it certainly had an impact on my grades at university of Florida. And, uh, finally what ended up is, uh, gosh, I think I, may have broke a record on being on academic probation at the time. <laughs> I needed like four <laughs> classes and uh, I would have graduated, but I just couldn't handle it anymore. So I, I left and uh, I had a, a couple job offers and my first one was in Clarksburg, West Virginia. And uh, I took off to be a, a anchor reporter uh, at the CBS affiliate in Clarksburg, West Virginia, which, um, you know, was great, but we were all out of college. So it was you know, a continuation of, of partying and yeah. And and, you know, I mean, that's we didn't know we weren't locals. <clears throat> so, you know, we were the first friends there. It was a great place to live, um, you know, in a small town. But that's really where, you know, you, you get your start. And uh, at that time, you know, so partying and, you know, having a good time. And, um, you know, I ended up meeting my co-anchor and um, ended up uh, falling in love. And uh, things happened quickly. And before you know it, we were getting married and headed off to Boise, Idaho. And, uh, you know, I think, uh, gosh, I look back now, uh, the, the first kiss with Christy happened to be after a DUI checkpoint, a DUI saturation, but I'm not kidding you. You know, this is probably was a red flag for her is, uh, we had, we were pulled over. It was on my birthday and the guy had, uh, given me a field sobriety. And I remember Christy actually saying, I rolled down the window guys like, you know, you've been drinking today. I'm like, no. And she's like, he's only had two. And I'm like, oh my oh God, are my you kidding me? God. You don't say that. She was, she's a, she, you know, she's very good, kind hearted person and i'm like are you kidding me and of course i had the stamps remember the stamps on the hands so this oh, guy oh yeah out. from the bars <laughs> yeah, like, oh yeah yeah and on top of it he looked at my license and he's like it's your birthday man you can have a couple beers you can have whatever and i'm like yeah yeah and then it was cold as hell in ann arbor that night and uh, I, we were both jumping around trying to stay warm out there and he's like look it i want to give you some field sobriety tests you can you know deny him you know and and, and that would be it you don't have to do it and i'm like oh awesome man i'll de deny that and he's like but then i take you to jail and i'm like oh shit it was like doo, 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 doo. and i'm like i'll do them so christy tells me later she's praying in the front of the car like you know let him pass on the pass whatever and sure enough i passed and then i blew and i was under the limit the guy went back in there and i looked at christy when i got in the car and i said i've been waiting a long time to do this and grabbed her by the back of the head and gave her a kiss so that was the first kiss with the 
the red and blue cherries popping behind you, and uh, that probably was a sign that uh, you, you know think? I probably needed to look. Yeah, yeah. God, I, you know, I cringe even thinking about it. To, you know, this day, and um, you know, I, uh, you know, Christy, we both partied. You know, so it wasn't it wasn't anything of a surprise to her. But I think you know, as as our relationship grew, it was something where you know, uh, I'm an alcoholic, so you know, I'm not going to grow out of it. <laughs> You know, it's going to keep coming with me. And I think there was a lot of pressure. And uh, as we continued on, uh, you know, it definitely put a strain. It wasn't everything, but it was definitely uh, put a strain on our relationship. And uh, it was something that her and I didn't necessarily understand. And uh, when we got to Boise, um, it was a tough job. Uh, The guy was sort of a jerk to me. The news director, he loved, uh, he didn't hire her, but he eventually hired her. He loved my ex-wife. And, uh, uh, I, you know, the drinking increased. Uh, it It was a hard place. Uh, it was, you know, a place, you know, I was losing a lot of confidence to get up in your head like a athlete and, you know, uh, you know, you're not good. And we were young. I mean, we, we were young. She was a couple years older than me, but we were still young. I wanted to be the, you know, the husband that provided all and not have her worry and do these things. And really all she wanted, you know, uh, was to be loved, you know, and, and more and, and trusted. And I think, you know, with the booze in there, that was uh, definitely something that, you know, we had, you know, good runs and then, you know, we had tough runs and then what you know would typically happen you know uh it'd be a bad night and you know uh, the next morning i'd wake up and i'd grab that bottle of vodka and i'd already written her like a long note you know things that i couldn't say to her in person you know uh, all the promises the promises and you know pouring the vodka down the drain and you know and she believed those things and you know come on we're we're in recovery and we mean them but yeah, you know course. without the help of a program or or understanding what we were doing uh it was just the the next thing and then you know we had the geographical relocation which was you know a huge promotion to go to phoenix and i think we both saw it as a fresh start but as you and i both know unless we're dealing with the problem that's going to be good for a while and then that's going to rear its ugly head mm-hmm. you know and it did the same thing in phoenix and uh there were times that you know i really regret you know uh getting drunk and and yelling at her and saying things that you know i never would have said you know to her when i was sober and uh it wasn't because i didn't love her uh i think it was you know because of the frustration but you know how it hurt her uh was something that kept me drinking for a long long time you know i hurt the person closest to me that loved me the most and i think that's very difficult and that shame and that guilt uh is overwhelming i mean i don't want to sit in that emotion and uh you know we would keep you know pushing through and you know uh, counseling is not going to help that you know per se uh you know they tried uh different you know techniques uh you know when really it should have been going to a 12-step program should have been treatment but we were both in um you know tv news so we wanted to keep that on the down low too because that is not something that you know even still on this day the news business embraces very well because um uh it's not like other companies you don't get a strike two or three and and go off you know you're tainted goods right get it but you're tainted goods and um you know that's actually that's actually surprising you know to to just because uh, you know in general most of you know in in california I mean, that's where, uh-huh. you know, where Hollywood is and where all the media yeah. is. And so yeah. there's so many actors that are that are very vocal and very public about their sobriety or their addiction or whatever the case may be. So it doesn't uh-huh. seem like, especially in California, that there is not that, that, that stigma. So it's yeah. like you say, even today in the news media, it's still yeah. the same taboo that it was 10 years ago. Yeah, you know, and I I get a lot more friends now, uh, or even people that are younger that you know have heard about the story or or have seen it, and that reach out, you know, saying, "Hey, you did it. I'm afraid this is what's going on," and it still exists. And I, you know, I I think some companies, corporations, I've seen the Fox Corporation help a couple of their you know high profile people where it should be. I yeah. I don't understand the fact that you know, look at we're all human. We all have problems. I don't think that you know reporters were Superman or anchors. We all have problems and issues that we go through uh oh, and why it created this this huge you know i guess it was more credibility uh which i can understand in some aspects i think you know i they look at you know when i was in phoenix you know the cops are helping me out getting me home and you know when i had to go back out there and do like a stand at a dui checkpoint and do a live report there's a tremendous amount of guilt knowing that there's a dui hanging over my head and back in this day you know people 
people didn't find out as much. So I get that, but I think there's something where people can stand and say, hey, look it, you know, I made a mistake. This is stupid. I went off and got help or, you know, this is what I had to do to do it. But, um, you know, the, it's just it, it needs to change in general. And I think that, you know, even with, you know, friends and family, I, I try to talk about, you know, some of the underlying causes of, or, you know, or reasons for for the uh, for the addiction. And people just don't get it. Oh, you know, they just don't get it. It's so frustrating. And, you know, it, it's so simple. It's a, you know, it's a simple program for complicated people. Yeah. And, um I don't know. You know, I, I, I love them all, but it's like I don't want them to have to find out on their own. So, you know, I'm, I'm always, the, you know. Well, um, as, as far as the media goes, I think that when we were talking about having an addiction problem, uh -huh. that's that's one thing. Getting caught on camera, pissing on a store, that yeah. could be that could be one <laughs> where it's like there's no coming back from this one, buddy. <laughs> no. Well, and, you know, it was uh, – <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was. I had an assistant news director. He'd gone on to another market, and he called me, and uh, he's like, "Geez, man, Coble." He goes, "I'm glad you're okay, but if you had to go out, you went out in a blazing glory, you know, true TV news style, you know." And I'm like, "Uh, oh, thanks." But you know, there is, and you know, it was all part of, uh, you know, you're especially an investigative reporter. People look for dirt on you. I mean, you're you're going after politicians, and the wrong word is going after. You're investigating politicians. You're looking at spending. You're looking at taxpayer waste and money. Well, they're looking at you, and I already had enough skeletons in the closet and when christie's book you know uh word got out you know that was coming out everybody was curious about it i found out after the fact but they didn't know what to do with it some people took a stab on the radio saying hey she's writing this book i don't know you know they were you know they brought it up but hell after this and i cussed out the cops i mean hey there it is there's the verbally abusive ex-husband you know in his prime uh caught on video uh at the intake uh out of the at, all at the outdoor mall and um, doing all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, I think there's there's a thing there that, uh, you know, I owned up. It was probably the first time in my drinking career <laughs> that I owned up to, uh, you know, saying I had a problem. I did a brief interview with the newspaper, the state newspaper there, and said, look, it. you know, I answered. I had to answer tough questions. And I, I, I look back now and I said that was the first step toward getting the help that I needed. And, you know, that was always important to me. Some people say you're fired and, eh, you know, it's here or there. You know, I resigned. And that was the first part of, you know, taking accountability, you know, for what would become really an amazing journey that uh, I never would have imagined, you know, one way or the other uh, where you'd be. And that's all because you don't go back to drinking and stuff. And I think that that's, uh, you know, one of the most important things. But, you know, cleaning up that wreckage is a is a pain in the ass. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I hear you. And. We all go through it. There's, there's no bypassing that. There's no bypassing uh -uh. cleaning up the wreckage. Nope. But I was just, when you mentioned the fact that, you know, they're, they're not as forgiving as, as I would assume in today's, in just, in just today's climate, you know, when it comes to talking about the disease of addiction, because I think most people have embraced the concept of the disease of addiction, that this is not a, uh, a moral failing with this is an illness no yep well and and that's an important part and i i don't know if they still get that they're getting a little bit more i mean it's the same with uh, depression um you know they're seeing that uh more and more now and i don't know if they're embracing it they see it as the liability but you know i, I think laws have changed a little bit too and uh typically like in my case you know uh you know my boss and uh, the corporation knew that you know christy had written her book i was having a tough time with it you know people were investigating and doing stuff they were there oh probably for the help but nobody's really sure how to necessarily approach you my closer friends knew i was you know once i got an advanced copy of the book and i was drinking my ass off and you know the wheels were off uh the wagon you know at that time and but they didn't know how to approach and i certainly at this time for the first time ever in my drinking career had really now um you know uh i you know as the good alcoholic and addict that i was when i picked this place in milwaukee of course uh it was right above you know a steakhouse uh uh, uh, Buffalo Wild Wings, Bar Louie, a uh, movie theater that served booze, uh, Trader Joe's, I could get my two-buck chuck. I mean, it was all walking distance. All I had to do was operate the elevator with my finger. And, you know, at the end, you know, that's really, I mean, really, in the end, it's really, you know, the telling. I had, you know, I'd watched over and over the um, Dr. Drew interview, you know, with Christy, and uh, I was really worked up, and I ran out of booze, and I saw those neon lights flash, and I'm like, 200 feet, 300 max. You know, a couple shots, a glass of wine, another shot, I'd be fine, no problem. And that's really when, you know, somebody in addiction can really screw up everything. I remember sitting in the back of the squad car saying, really? You've got to be kidding me. I mean, how could this have gone like this? 
and it did. I mean, it, you know, prime example, and Milwaukee, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where it's a time honored tradition to eat and drink. Yes. My, you know, mine was unacceptable. My drinking was unacceptable to them. That was a bad thing. <laughs> you know, it was it was time to sneak out and leave Milwaukee. I mean, when in when your drinking is unacceptable to the people of Milwaukee and Wisconsin, uh, it's time for treatment. You know, I remember the first. Uh, it was an employee assistance program. I, I went. You know, I go to this lady and I come in there and I've got this uh, copy of you know Christie's book or you know, and I said she's like, well, you know, what's going on? I'm like this. You know, she's like, wow, that's a lot. And she's like, you drinking? I go, yeah, I, I, you know, drinking too much. And she talks a little bit more. And she's like, well, just try cutting back. And of course, the alcoholic. I'm like, great. I went. I tried to get help. She said, cut back, not stop. <laughs> so I said, good. I'll see you in a couple of months. <laughs> you oh. know. And I don't think it lasted another two months after <laughs> no. that. It was, uh, it was, it was certainly the end. And it uh, was, you know, I, I'm very, I'm very grateful uh, that I didn't hurt anybody, kill anybody, kill myself. Uh, the tremendous amount of guilt and shame, you know, uh, for letting people down at work, my family, having to go through that. Um, but, you know, really it's uh, the part is, you know, then like you said, picking up the pieces and uh, learning how to live a life, you know, free of, you know, drugs and alcohol. Yes. No, 100 percent. Now, you mentioned the, the CNN interview or the uh, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, the Dr. Drew interview. Uh-huh. Now, what were the highlights on that interview that yeah. like were that were really that, yeah. that really kind of burned you? Yeah, no, that's a great question because somebody was I was talking to somebody the other day and they're like, "Well, you didn't think you needed help?" And I'm like, hey, "Yeah, of course I needed help." You know, I uh, it was bad. What really got you? And I think uh, it was a couple things. Number one, I've always respected Dr. Drew. I think Christy and I used to watch, um, you know, Celebrity Rehab or whatever it was, and uh, it was the first time in all these different interviews where Drew just came out and said, "Look it, here's the problem." He said, "I feel sorry for the guy. You know, this is a guy who didn't get help." And, you know, he goes, it's all about drinking. He was a different person when he was drinking than when he was not. No AA, no Al-Anon, nothing gets better. And uh, then it was specifically they went into, you know, Christy shared, Drew, Drew just nods his head a lot. But, you know, Christy shared, you know, uh, uh, one of the last straws was a $200 bar bill. And, you know, we were in Phoenix, and I told her we weren't drinking. Well, what the hell? I'm an alcoholic. Of course I'm going to lie about that. You know? I mean, it, was a, it was a British pub. I mean, $200 worth of food in that place, I could have fed half of downtown Phoenix. Uh, but that's, you know, how bad the disease is. And, you know, she saw it as something that was, um, you know, that I wanted to pull over the wool over her eyes. And she was getting tired of it. And I, I, I don't blame that part. I think there were other things, too, where, you know, where you get into your uh, life. I think she talked about, which really wasn't a, a true thing. There there were a lot of things that weren't true, but there were other things that were right on. But, you know, we got into a fight on our uh, honeymoon and she slept on the couch. These were real personal things. And, you know, when you're sitting there watching these things um, and some of them that you'd forgotten, uh, and, you know, like the book, I think that's what it did is, uh, you know, it really uh, pulled off a, you know, a, a Band-Aid on a gunshot wound. And really, I, you know, ended up going through divorce a second time around. Uh, there were things in there I read and, you know, I had forgotten about that were true and that hurt me, you know, and I know that I hurt her, you know, immensely. And other things she made up that just pissed me off, you know, uh, and I get that to sell a book, too. Um, and I was disappointed in, uh, I, I told somebody this the other day too, I was disappointed in a couple things and I was disappointed in the journalism. She also recorded two country music songs, you know, <laughs> and she had a video that she premiered that night with Dr. Drew. And I'm like, whoa, 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 where are we going with all this stuff? And I know that, you know, it's a competitive uh, 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 nature out there. And her coworkers, Drew, Sanjay Gupta, Robin Mead, Nancy Grace, you know, they all had her on, you know, their shows and they had their own books. And, um, you know, they all wrote, they wrote different things about how they, you know, escaped, you know, panic attacks or Jane Velez Mitchell, how she did her own recovery. Christy wrote about me. And that was a, that was a hard thing because I think, you know, it takes two. And, you know, we both faced a lot of challenges in that in that relationship. And I certainly own up to my part and, you know, um, still feel, you know, awful about, you know, some of those tough days. And uh, but, you know, very, very grateful in the end that, uh, you know, through this movie, uh, through uh, Leap, uh, the coaches made me see something. I used to bitch that, you know, I couldn't get jobs when I got out of treatment because Google. And that's certainly I, I lost jobs because of Google. Yeah, that thing lit up like a Christmas tree. Put my name in there. That thing lit up like a Christmas tree. Oh, and I had people there. I mean, where do you start? 
you know, you pissed on the Apple store drunk, you know, you cussed out the cops, uh, you have an ex-wife. They didn't even know what to do, where to start with that. And that was humbling because I had to pick up phones, call, you know, the TV news agents. And they, some of them, you know, took my call, I think out of curiosity to see if I was alive. And I said, look, you know, I'm sober now. I'm trying to pick up the pieces. Do you have any advice <laughs> or jobs, you know? And uh, what the coaches made me see was uh, something that, you know, we all should have known, or I should have known in, in recovery, resentments, you know, and when I left treatment, I spent 90 days in Greensboro in treatment, you know, they would, they would ask me, it was a deep South, you know, they say, you know, you pray for your ex-wife. I said, you know, I just ignore them half the time, you know, and <laughs> finally I got fed up of hearing them say that. And I finally said, yes, I did. They said, you prayed for your ex-wife. I said, I did. They said, you did? I said, yeah, I prayed that when the bus hit her, it would be quick. And they laughed, <laughs> you know, and they shook their head because they knew me too, you know, and they're just like, well, it's a start. And uh, so I carried that, you know, again, you know, for a long time. And um, I was working for a minor league baseball team in Charlotte, North Carolina, when the casting director came and said, look, we'd like to use your story. And in return, you know, we'll help you, which I didn't have the money to do or, or anything. And uh, I was stuck in, in my own recovery. Uh, I was not happy at the baseball team. I was working, you know, uh, surrounded by booze every day. It was nine months. It was tough. It wasn't what I wanted to do. And I'm a, a big, you know, firm believer in, in chasing your purpose and passion and you know i wanted to come out here and partly help you know work with people in addiction and recovery and and, and pick up a life so i said the hell with it sold my emmy award to a guy on ebay in germany who now has my emmy uh to sold my star wars collection uh got a small savings came out here and started shooting the film and what i thought coaching was was like we we're going to sit down and you know work on my resume or you know job things do all that kind of stuff and then when i get out here and they start talking about forgiveness they start talking about you know um uh you know not being so hard on yourself or lack of self-esteem i'm like where the hell did that come in coaching i didn't get this i didn't sign up for this stuff this is this is treatment and they're like yeah yeah you know and i'm like oh crap and they're like uh, one of them marcy shimoff was great she's like you know can you forgive christy i'm like hell no there's no way in hell I'll forgive her ever. And she asked me a question, and she's like, "Well, what's, what's the point? You know, what do you get out of it?" I said, "Absolutely nothing." And I said, "You know, in the days that I would wish her the worst, uh, because we worked with each other for two and a half years uh, after we were divorced, I knew she would get married before me, have a family, do the things we dreamed of, and I had a front row seat for that in the newsroom. And that's when you know I became really, really good friends with Gray and Gray Goose." And, um, you know, it just continued from there. And, you know, it was a lot of resentment build up. And, you know, the, the coach, Marcy, had a real good point. She said, what do you get? And I said, I feel like I'm giving up. You know, and he said, giving up what? Are you giving yourself a, a reason to forgive yourself and to, you know, move on with Chrissy? And I said, well, I have to figure out a way to do that and make it, you know, be genuine. And I said, I, I can't just tell you I'm going to forgive her right now because I'm still pissed. So eventually, you know, what you end up seeing, you know, I think, you know, is in the film, if, you know, if it, it makes that is uh, I've been deathly afraid of heights all my life, but I needed something to propel me forward. So I, I went to, ta you'll know, Taft, uh, Taft in the desert. And um, I went out there and I, I jumped uh, tandem uh, skydiving out of a plane. And for me, it was the importance of leaving, you know, all that shame and guilt, you know, up in that plane and having that, you know, take off at – uh, 20,000 feet and uh, go on. And then when I hit the ground, I would hit the ground running, you know, working toward working with people in addiction and recovery and picking up the pieces of my life. And um, there was another coach, uh, D. Martini, John D. Martini. He has a, a couple different processes. And just like you said, it, it made me think of it, you know, journey. He's like, Rob, what if you just look at everything that's happened in your life and take away the good or bad, that it's just part of the journey? And that really made me feel like, well, it takes away a lot of that pain and suffering. It's just part of your journey that got you here today. And then the other part, the, the irony is uh, Christy got through a lot of the emotional abuse you know, that uh, she talked about in her book. Uh, believe it or not, through this guy, John D. Martini, somebody else that was teaching the method, the D. Martini method, that requires – or it doesn't require, but what you do is you come up with reasons how it benefited you. So I'm sitting out there in Malibu with this guy, and he's like, how did her writing the book benefit you? Oh, I was like, I don't want to hear this because I see it coming out of her mouth right now, your face. And I'm like, this is just pissing me off right now. But you know, when he – broke it down i was really humbled and i hope the film shows that because at the end you know he <clears throat> he said have you ever thanked her you know and i was like no i haven't you know and i think that was it's a humbling thing you know it, it changed my life it, it altered the course the same thing with drew pinsky um it altered the course to a life that i never ever 
would have imagined I'd be living, that I'd be living in Southern California um, at 45 years old. Uh, yeah, it, it's tough, and I, and I want people to understand that it doesn't happen overnight, um, that, you know, this is just my journey. This is what it looks like, for, you know, for me. But, you know, as a kid, I always dreamed of, you know, rolling onto a movie studio lot, my name at the gate, going to a soundstage to work, you know, and I do that. Um, I've done two movies uh, that are, you know, the topics are passionate, you know, that I'm about sharing a story that I hope, you know, will help others. You know, back in treatment, they said, you know, your story is going to help others someday, you know, that deep southern draw. And I said, bullshit, how's that going to be? I was just pissed, you know. <laughs> I said, there's no way this is going to help other people. And uh, people come up and they talk to me and I share and, uh, you know, I, I see that, you know, it does help. And I think that's why it's important to have shows like yours that, you know, we, we, we get out there and do it. Again, this is my journey. And right. it's just something I'm a you know firm believer in finding a purpose and passion. And I'm not sure everybody, you know, feels that way. But to me, I think it's really integral part of my recovery because having jobs that, you know, you're unhappy or it's a grind, I'm afraid, that, you know, I'd go back out eventually or I would just want to give up. And, uh, you know, I don't have another run out there. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know if I'll make it. Or if I'll even come back, and I'm not gonna, I, I can't risk that. You know, for all the few things that I have now, um, you know, I can't. I, I basically, you know, now I, uh, as I get closer to things, I, I do background work. Um, again, I'm very fortunate because they'll feed you a couple times a day, and if you haven't been on a movie set, craft services is unfreaking believable. <laughs> Fridays typically are steak dinners, but you know, you're the lowest thing on the totem pole. Uh, you are below the production assistants, and uh, so you eat after the cast, the crew. The production assistants. Uh, my rate is, you know, ten fifty an hour. Uh, so typically it's eight hours and eighty four dollars. But you get time and a half. You you do that. I get a haircut, you know, for a couple of roles. Uh, you know, I've been stuck in the seventies with This Is Us and a couple other films and or uh, TV shows that have been in the seventies. But um, for me, I, I'm watching what they're doing. I'm picking up everything I possibly can. And we've got a show, um, you know, called Story Junkie that you know uh, we've got some interest in. And really, it, it's about this journey and it's about meeting people like you. It's about, you know, where life takes you and the people that pop into my life and the things that, you know, happen along the way because I, you know, found out through, you know, recovery is that one thing I miss the most is not the way TV news is today, but I miss telling people stories and I miss, you know, seeing that inspiration and what I learned from them. You know, don't laugh at this one. You'll fall out of your chair in Costa Rica. But uh, through this wacky, you know, trip, uh, Andy Dick has been a huge supporter of mine and a, and a good friend. Yeah, you can laugh. Because <laughs> yeah. a lot of people will be on my Facebook and they saw pictures or we're you know we're flying a drone or swimming in Malibu and they're like I had an old girlfriend send me a text and was like hey it's good to see you looking so great and everything good is that Andy Dick <laughs> you know like yeah how did you two I go I I don't know but you know he helped me put together a monologue he helped me you know work on a one man show and he's taught me a lot about Hollywood and the 33 years that you know he's been out here and struggled with his own and of course he reminds me he's like hey, whatever pissing on the Apple store is nothing I'm like well of course it's nothing compared to you you terrorized Hollywood for a good decade before you got sober you know, a decade and a half, maybe. I, I, I don't know. So, you know, those are the things that, you know, I'm very, you know, fortunate for because I'm I'm trying to, you know, take the skills that I have and, and learn something new. And uh, while it's not glamorous, I love it. And I think that's the most important thing that, you know, we've got to chase and people can do it. You know, a lot of people stand on the sideline in life and I, I just can't do it. I, I ended up working. I, I don't know if you know who Bob Forrest is. If you watch Celebrity Rehab, he was um, Drew Pinsky's sidekick with the hat. He was in Thelonious Monster, and um, he's probably one of the. I should be up to speed on this, but uh, that's no. old, though. I, okay, I, I okay. Don't hear that all the celebrity okay. rehabs, but he's got you know he's got an amazing story too. I think he went to twenty two different rehabs, and I ended up working at his place in Malibu and uh, uh, learning the business and working with people on the overnight shift. And uh, like I said, I, I really couldn't have pictured any of this. Oh, and, and for me, um, you know, I don't know what's in store, uh, you know, what's next. I do know that, um, you know, what's in store if I go back to the bottom of the bottle. And I do know what's in store if, um, you know, I don't take care of myself and, and stay on top of things. And, you know, I tell people a lot of times it's always easier to go back than it is to go forward. 
And uh, I, you know, I remind myself that all the time is, you know, it's the unknown. But you know, I've, I've, uh, you know, just in the last month, I've worked on, you know, this is us, Veep, Bush, uh, or excuse me, Bosch, you know, Curb Your Enthusiasm, American Girl, uh, small little roles, probably unseen for some of them, other ones that that are bigger. But I've, I, I'm learning something, and there's a momentum, and I know that somebody will give me a chance working on on a crew, which I really would like to do, or, or writing and, and producing a little bit more. I was just in New York, um, field producer and doing interviews with, uh, if you're a baseball fan, and Lenny Dykstra. He is not in recovery, uh, but he's working <laughs> on a reality show uh, with the old days of Doc Gooden and some of the baseball players from the Mets and uh, the Phillies. And uh, I was very fortunate to be asked to go and, you know, do an interview with him and try to, you know, get a different side for, you know, his show. Uh, and that's all because of, you know, I, I, you know working a program, um, you know, uh, staying on top and, you know, trying not to be so hard on myself. And I just want people not to give up. No, absolutely not. Um, just so our listeners, because I'm sure our listeners are, are listening and going, okay, so Christy, what uh, Rob is referring to is Christy Paul. Uh, she wrote a book called Love Isn't Supposed to Hurt. And I was looking over here just in, in part of the media. Google or, land. <laughs> yeah, Google land, where the book describes you as abusive and made her feel worthless. So I'm assuming that those were the topics that were being discussed in the interview, right? Yeah, well, that her interviews um, talked about the words that I called her, some of the things I said to her, um, and they were tough. I guess I finally learned in the end there was really no reason why. I was drunk. And, you know, that night after the, the Dr. Drew interview when I was sitting at the bar, I remember feeling exactly thinking about what I'd said to the woman I love so much and how I did not show that to her and uh, the guilt and shame that I felt and how mad I was at myself. And, you know, I, you know, we don't tend to drink, you know, about the problems. We drink at them. Right. And I was so mad I had to, I had to black out. So I was in a rush to quickly black out and not feel this anymore. But, you know, she writes about that. The song's about that. Um, you know, she has uh, taken her journey to help others, uh, you know, so that you can get over this. You don't have to stay in a relationship like this. Christy was a, still is a, you know, a, a religious person where she felt that, you know, marriage, when she said yes, you know, you were stuck forever unless there was a reason. I think that, you know, in the end, I, I, I totally understand, you know, her wanting to leave. Uh, I would, too. But I think it was the way that it happened, the way that a book comes out 12 years later that, you know, still to me is sometimes a, a difficult pill to swallow. I hear you. I hear you. And and of course, of course, you know, I'll tell you, you know, just a, a quick story about, you know, what happened to me. Of course, it wasn't in the media. But when I was just in the beginning stages of, of getting sober, I mean, we're talking months. So I was still crazier than a jailhouse rat. <laughs> the emotions were up and down all over the place. There's just these huge spikes of either rage or depression. And this whole time I'm married and my wife's trying to help me get through this. Uh, mm -hmm. What neither one of us obviously knew what was happening is she was just enabling me by not by not leaving me. She should have left me. Yeah. Way before, you know, the real shit hit the fan. And uh -huh. so when I started to sober up, you know, I started to feel that she was distancing herself from me. She was colder. She was she was a different person, right? And I didn't know how to explain. Mm -hmm. So of course, I go home and I go into the house and I I know she always keeps a diary, so I went in and I read her uh, diary. You know what I mean? Oh, I know, yeah, yeah. And you and I start reading this stuff, man, and it's about me. And of course, now all of a sudden I'm enraged, right? <laughs> now, years later, I go back in it. It's not so much that I was in ra I, I recognize what it is now. Of course, I was pissed off. But the underlying feeling is a fear and of being hurt. That's the, those are the true underlying feelings. Like knowing that this is true. I'm reading mm -hmm. this and this stuff mm -hmm. is true. So years later, it's like, I'm so sorry. Yeah. I'm so sorry for being such an asshole. Yeah. And the reality yeah. of it is it's not her fault. It's not my fault. I have a disease. I am an alcoholic. I am a drug addict. But how we deal with it, that's where the, that's where the magic happens, right? So I'm assuming exactly. that at the time it was, did you read it right away? Like it came out and did you read the book or did you wait a while to read it? Or, you know, how long did it take? No, luckily I had a friend because, you know, you know, the worst thing you do to an addict alcoholic is tell him on Friday that, hey, I'm going to have to speak to you on Monday about a job because we're all up in our heads. You know, we're going to get it. We don't know we're going to get a promotion, but we're, we're, we're destroyed, right? You know, I'm all in my head. I'm all screwed up. He's going to fire me. I'm going to do what an hour all he wants to say is a good job. So I don't like surprises and like hell, I was going to wait till that thing dropped in May. Uh, I had a friend who was a publicist who got an advanced copy of 
of the uh, galley for, of the book. Uh-huh. So I read that in February, and then I knew up until like April and beginning of May, uh, I had a little bit of time. But you know, I was coming out, and other advanced copies had been there. And uh, when I read it, you know, I remember like a being like a ten year old calling my mom, you know, saying, "I can't believe she wrote that." You know, this thing at the beginning is I, I didn't even know that was our wedding. I mean, this is you know, it, it is. It, it's overwhelming, and you're right. You know, you know the feeling reading in a diary, you know, what it is. And of course there's uh, remorse that, you know, it's Mary Kubler Ross. I mean, you go through the stages, you know, and then that stage of pissed off, you know, Oh, that got me going good, you know? And, um, and then it was just the fear of people finding out, but yeah, it, it's a, it's a painful thing to read that I, you know, th- through addiction and the disease that it is something that she didn't understand. And we both didn't understand at that time, even though it was in my family, it was in her family too, uh, that it wasn't about willpower, you know, even my dad, he came to, you know, family weekend and he apologized to me. And I'm like, why? And he's like, because everything I was telling you was wrong. Mm-hmm. I said, that's okay. We, none of us knew. You know, it's just stop. You can stop. No, you know, and at the end, you know, I was taking a handful. You know, I would try to stop, but I couldn't sleep because now this is now, you know, taking over my life. It's, you know, I, I'm on that death roll. And, um, you know, I'm taking a handful of over-the-counter sleeping pills to sleep at night. Uh, I can't sleep. I'm adding weight. I'm pre-diabetic. Uh, I bought illegal prescription pills that were nothing but speed, you know, through freaking Germany or something like that. I it was just a shit show as soon as I read that book. And uh, I don't think, you know, I ever – I didn't know how to process that without booze. The only way I, I knew how at the time. And Christy uh, felt, you know, it was something important for her to share. Right. Now, how long how long was that run? How long did that run last after you read the book, you went on the run, and you found sobriety? It was probably, uh, I think it was about about six months. It wasn't very long. Okay. So it was February. Yeah. I okay. mean, it was, you know, it was really the Drew thing. And that was – that was a shit show. I mean, right. that, there was no but and if about it and how I was still getting nominated for Emmys and, and doing stuff. But there was a school bus driver that had ended up with a high profile case. We did background checks, a school bus driver. She sued me. So the other media was like, well, if you can look into her past, we can look into yours. I mean, it was a total shit show that all came down at the same time. And Bill O'Reilly and Megyn Kelly were talking about the lawsuit that the school bus driver was suing. And, you know, I knew and in like two weeks, Christie's book was coming out and – there, you know, I know the media well enough, and they didn't really like me in Milwaukee. They didn't really get the investigative reports, I think. And um, I knew what was coming down the pike, and sure as shit, you know, uh, they watched up until that night, and then, you know, they could connect it. You know, it was easy to connect all those kind of things, and um, you know, that's really where it, where it fell apart. And I'm, if it didn't, oh man, I don't know, oh, you know, where it'd be if I'd even be alive. Well, and I, and and that's the point I'm trying to get at too. I get it. We all get it because we've all been there. We've all been there at the beginning, right? Or or knee deep in the addiction, right? Yep. The shit hits the fan, and all of a sudden, it's like I'm a victim here, right? Oh and, yeah, and, yeah. And I, I, it's almost impossible for me to take any responsibility whatsoever because I've just been attacked. So yeah. regardless of what I did, this is completely unacceptable. However, yep. four years later, right? Yeah. Four yeah. years later. The person that you are today, someone who is advocating in behalf of sobriety and getting clean and staying clean and working a program, and you reprocess this book, right? <laughs> yeah. Like, what is the feeling that you have now? Like, I know the feeling. <laughs> I know the feeling I have now. Uh huh. When I think about the diary. Uh huh. What is yours? Oh, the feeling I have now is well, there were stages, like you say, when I was making amends to her. Uh huh. Because at that point I had already I had already worked most of my steps. So by the time uh-huh. I got to step nine, I had owned all my shit. Uh huh. Everything was about me. Once I did the step four inventory, I had to look at my side of every single resentment. And of course, my side of this one was huge. So yeah. at that yeah. point, when I came to her and I made amends, all of that stuff it was it was just all on me. Like I recognized yeah. that that even though I was not responsible for my disease. I was now responsible for my recovery. And oh, yeah. even though technically I'm not responsible for all the wreckage that I caused, I had to own it so that I could get better, uh-huh. right? Like I had to move on. Like I've told this story before. I mean, I, I was at a convention and I told my story. And part of it is me stalking my ex-wife and, you know, getting into the house <laughs> and, and reading the <laughs> diary, you know, that kind <laughs> of a thing. And, yeah, every, yeah. and everybody in the audience is like, ooh, <laughs> ah, ah. And, and, you know, like... You deserve everything that you're about to get when you read this. 
But then years later, it's like, God, I, I really needed, I really needed all of that. I really needed to know who I was and what I did so that I could, I, you know, so that I could make the amends that I needed to. It, it has just made me the person that I am today. Like when I, mm-hmm. when I think about how I am with my current wife, right? I would never, ever do the things to her that I did to, to my ex-wife. So to me, it's just been a springboard to becoming the person that I am today. So I'm, I'm mm-hmm. wondering if, you know, you're reading this book, right? But four years later, you got recovery and you're like, well, man, you know what I mean? Like, this is who I was. Do I ever want to be this person again? I, you know, that's- Hell no. The, okay. Yeah. So that's yeah. the question I'm asking. Like, you know, what does it do today when you think about it? Well, I mean, you know, it makes me aware of the words I use, you know, when I talk to people, not just women or anything like that. It makes me aware of, uh, you know, what I was like, you know, drinking when I was scared. Uh, You know, I'll I'll say that, you know, again, like you asked about, you know, Drew's interview and stuff, you know, and that was uh, the final dose that I needed to hear specifically related to alcohol from a guy who's very knowledgeable about it. (laughs) Even put Christina in his place, you know, in her place in that interview saying, whoa, 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 wait, whatever. This guy, you know, he ended up driving home something like you talked about reading in your uh, ex-wife's, you know, uh, diary and stuff. He drove it home. And at that stage, I could not handle that on top of everything else. And that's what happened to Milwaukee. But then I was able to process over the years and it took time and I was able to find forgiveness, you know, for Christy. You know, there's one thing I would I would like, you know, she's got her story and I have mine. Then the only thing I'd like is that I think it's so powerful. Listen, we're not going to be on stage together singing Kumbaya and holding hands. I get that. You know, I don't think it's healthy for either one of us, you know, but I think there is something where, you know, you can acknowledge the person and say, hey, he did change. He doesn't have to go in my store. I don't give a shit about that. But, you know, people do change. Oh, just like you did. You have a healthy relationship now. You're not always the villain. You're not always the bad person because we took the responsibility for our disease. You know, it's you know, we're not responsible for the disease, but we're responsible for our recovery. And I did. And, you know. It will we be, you know, uh, together for better or for worse till death do us part? Probably. Shit, thanks to Google, thanks to the book, you know, and that always makes, you know, challenges there. But I learned a lot from it. You know, I think it, it was it was hard. But, you know, she probably, I think, as uh, the one coach said, uh, you know, you think she saved your life. And I think she did. I think that's a very humbling thing to say, you know, still to this day. It is not something that, you know, I also want to respect in in some aspects. Her privacy is like I don't feel the need to pick up the phone and call her. You know, we know how the steps work in making amends. We don't want to do any more damage. And I think that, you know, some of the stuff that I see and hear that she says, I think, you know, while she says she forgives me, I think there's still, you know, some resentment there that she needs to work through. Uh, She's happily remarried. Pete seems like a great guy. They have three beautiful daughters. And she's got the life I hope that she's always wanted uh, and that she dreamed of. And uh, I'm sad that our life, you know, didn't have it there. I'll always love her. I'm not in love with her, but I'll always love her. And I hope that, you know, if she listens and she sees these things that that I talk about, that she understands that it wasn't her, that there was a disease involved. And that disease took so much out of my life. And uh, before it finally took me, you know, took a career, took her, it did all these things. And that's what it was about. And that, you know, sometimes there is no rhyme nor reason. Those words and things, you know, that I said and screaming and yelling, you know, that hurt her so much that uh, I regret so much to this day. And, uh, you know, I, I'm not as hard on myself. I'm still upset. I wasn't raised that way. But I realized that's the disease. And that's why I think talking openly about it and, and sharing these things uh, is important to other people. Uh, I Harmontown was a podcast. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I just heard somebody else talk about a, a guy talk about being, you know, verbally abusive. And and uh, I didn't understand that. Uh, that was something that was uh, totally different from what I was, you know, how I was raised and, and brought up. But uh, I look back and, you know, that book, while I don't always know if it was for the right reasons, it, it, it changed my life and it saved me. And, you know, I hope that it, it's helped Christy heal, too. And, she's, you know, she says it has and the things that I've read and seen. I think that inevitably, once we get into recovery and we truly embrace this program, that miracles happen. They just they just do. Yeah. And the process, your life, your journey unfolds naturally yeah. as you become of service to others. I think that's key. Our life up until we got deep into the addiction and then through the addiction was all about self-service, all about me, 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 and, and, and what about me? And it just only gets worse when we get deep into the addiction. Then we come into recovery, and the reason why we're doing this, the reason why we're on the air right now is to help others. Period. Yep, that's right. It's the only reason why we're doing this. Yep. And so that in and of itself, that behavior, that change behavior of 
helping others and being of service, it opens the opportunity to have miracles happen in, in our lives. And I believe that everything in my life today, there's no way, there's absolutely no way I could have done this or accomplished the things I did or have the relationships that I do today if I didn't completely revamp my entire being. I had, I had to like wipe the hard drive completely. Yep. I had to remove all the character defects, all the, the learned behavior, like you were talking about. Like me growing up as a kid, uh, my dad was a tough guy to be around growing up. He had a, whole, had a really, really bad temper. And so mm -hmm. that's what I grew up around. I grew up around a lot of verbal abuse in the house. Mm -hmm. that, that takes a life of its own once I leave the house and then once the addiction kicks in, right, it just goes to another level. So what we've yep. done through the recovery is once we start to change, the people around us, we think that they're changing. No, we've changed. And so their attitude towards us changes. And then all of a sudden, the world just looks different. Oh, it's a perfect way. Mel Gibson says, you probably heard it, is hugging the cactus. You know, uh, I think he, he told Robert Downey Jr. years ago, hugging the cactus is hugging till it doesn't hurt. It's getting those impurities, is, 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 is embracing yourself and learning, you know, those character defects and, and, and until it doesn't hurt anymore. And I think, you know, that's partly what the rooms are about. I don't want to use a whole bunch of the cliches, but going to a place where you feel loved, you know, until you can love yourself. <laughs> hugging the cactus. You haven't heard that? No, but I love it. <laughs> Hey, I'm going to send you, when we get off this, I, you can put it on your website too. There is a, uh, with Robert Downey Jr., he, he returned the favor to Mel Gibson. And uh, he talks about uh, how Mel told him, you got to hug the cactus. And uh, I'm going to send you the link when we get off, uh, when we're done with this interview. And it's only like three minute uh, uh, speech and Mel comes out, but hugging the cactus. And he describes it a hell of a lot better than I do. But that's what Mel Gibson's always said. You got to hug that goddamn cactus doesn't, <laughs> until it doesn't hurt anymore. And, you know, I, I could sort of relate to that is like, you know, it sucks, but keep hugging it because eventually it ain't going to hurt anymore. Now we've learned how to, at least I've learned how to sit in those emotions. I can talk to you now about the things that I said to Christy, and I'm not proud of them, but I can, it happened, dude. I, I can't take it back. I can understand and I can try to show people, you know, why it was like that. But, you know, I had to hug that goddamn cactus for so long. And then, you know, of course, I made it even worse because I just resented her. And every time I, you know, wished something bad on her, she was like the Antichrist. It came back at me tenfold. I should have stopped a long time ago. Yeah, absolutely, man. I mean, I remember, I remember when, you know, I found out about my ex-wife was seeing somebody else. Mm. And I mean, I went through the roof. I went bananas. <laughs> and I remember my my sponsor was like, who is now the stepfather to my daughter. And the guy is just like one of the most amazing guys. He's truly a friend of mine today, which is, and again, it's all recovery related. But at the time I wanted to light him on fire. <laughs> so so I remember I remember sharing about it at the, at the meetings, right? And I, and I remember my sponsor coming out and going, have you tried praying for him? And I'm like, oh. I go, I pray for him all the time. I pray that he gets hit by a bus, like on a regular basis. <laughs> of course, right? And he goes, he goes, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, pray for him for two weeks. Ugh. If you do it every day for two weeks, you tell me if you still feel the same way. And I got to tell you, that exercise was years ago. And <laughs> it worked. It was yeah. crazy. But, you know, when you allow God into your life, it's a game changer. It's an absolute game changer. And the more you allow yourself, allow the miracle to happen, the more you remove yourself from your own, you know, ridiculous decision making process about what you feel you're entitled to, and you spend more uh -huh. time being of service, everything is just, it becomes intuitive, right? Mm -hmm. You intuitively know how to handle situations that used to baffle us. I mean, it's more, I, I, I can go on for days with, you know, recovery jargon and rhetoric, but it, it's all true. Yeah, no, you're right. You're right. And I think that, you know, God, you know, Christy is, you know, is religious. And uh, look, at, I, 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 I said this before I could even forgive her, is that I think that, you know, she was put into my life as a way to find that, you know, faith, uh, that uh, spirituality, to fill that void, uh, to help me see another side. But I wasn't ready, you know, and I couldn't because I was so, you know, void from the booze, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, no, I, I, I absolutely agree. I don't think that it was, you know, uh, a twist of faith that, you know, uh, he, he put it into my life. I wasn't ready. And I think that's just part about life, you know, all the time. When, you know, when the hell are we ready? I, I think you're absolutely right is, you know, that's a, the key part. Uh, you know, a lot of people, I'll talk more about the, the spirituality side than the religious side. Uh, but, you know, my higher power is definitely God. And, you know, uh, when I say trust the process and have faith, that's what I'm referring to. 
And uh, that's a hard thing for me to get out of, you know, I hate using all the cliches, but it's a hard thing to get out of my own way. Yes. And, you know, to let that, you know, let that go. But then there's a serenity prayer and I have to do that and don't, you know, Hey, I'm, I'm doing it, gritting my teeth sometime, you know, ready to, you know, <laughs> go nuts, but, you know, realize, look, it, it's just something I can't control. And being an investigative reporter or something that, you know, I, uh, a young kid that's, you know, coming up trying to be, he's like, how did you detach? And I'm like, well, shit, at the end, that was part of the problem. I couldn't. I just had to go drink, you know. I, I everybody was against you and I, the world, and it just it made it worse. So I didn't know how to, you know, process those things. Just you know that it was business, and I think that's that's you know that that's really important. And you know those things all just built up to be a freaking mess. Absolutely. I'm just so thankful for the day, you know, uh, for you know being sober today. I, you know, living in Southern California uh, and the and the wacky journey that you know it's put me on, and the the people I I meet, you know, for Malibu and it's twenty dollar uh, smoothies and uh, the three dollar. <laughs> hey, by the way, maybe I got to enter. I'm going to send you another link to a guy that I met out here, Khalil Rafati, and maybe you can get him on your uh, dude. Webcast. I would love to have Khalil on the show, man. As a matter of fact, I remember reaching out to him. Right. But I think I was too early on. And in, in, I mean, I was brand new when I launched this. But now I'm, I'm heading to my 100th episode. So I've been around a little while. Dude, I yeah. heard his story on Rich Roll. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Blew Amazing, my mind. Amazing story. He's like a smoothie king now, right? Oh, well, it's crazy. If you haven't seen him on 2020 and everything, of course, when you work out in Malibu, you end up meeting everybody. And yeah. these stories out there like Rich Roll and all these guys, that was just feeding me. And I was like, I cannot believe this. And Khalil uh, is a great guy. And I'm actually referring to Sun Life Organics and the you know the, the Million Dollar Shaker, uh-huh. uh, I forget what it is, is, uh, is 20 bucks. The other ones are about 10, but I like the Wolverine. And uh, I think he's opening up in, you know, in Hawaii now, but he's got 10 locations. He's turned his life around. He's eight years sober. And uh, um, what he's done is is absolutely amazing, and being of ser- of service and. I love going over to his place, and you see what it happens out here is how supportive the community is. And, and Khalil uh, is a is a prime example of um, doing the the right things and finding your purpose and passion. And you know, one thing that caught me about his story is he was doing some sea bought a sober living, and you know, he wanted to help people, but he just didn't like the the treatment business, which I could understand. But he wanted to still help, so he started putting together Sun Life Organics, and you know, he, I guess sometimes they talk about it or not. But Rick Solomon, you know, uh, backed a lot of the money, and people laughed at him but the guy chased his freaking dreams and he's jetting around and you know it's the uh smoothies to the stars and and people doing well and khalil is uh is really an amazing story of uh survival from drug dealer to the stars any odd job to really being dead have you read his book no no but the interview in and of itself it talks about how yeah him being out in the streets strung out it was the most crazy interview i just remember going oh my god it was yep. just a miracle Right? Yep. That, that guy, oh, it's a miracle. The guy's, he's alive. Yep. And that, you know, now he does such good, you know, for everybody else. And uh, again, I, is it uh, t- uh, 10 locations? I know it was like $10 million in smoothies, but they're, uh, they put one on USC's campus. He's uh, building out in, um, what do you call it, uh, Hawaii uh, now, too. And uh, Costa Rica ought to be on the map. I mean, it's, it's definitely, uh, you can get your wheatgrass shots. And, you know, Khalil loves fitness. And I think, you know, he's learned a lot from Rich Roll, too, which uh, is another amazing story. See, those guys, all, I haven't gotten to that physical fitness stage yet. That's why they scare the shit out of me. Yeah, you no know, doubt. I still got my Coca-Cola. I want to get there, man. I want to get there. But I ain't in that category <laughs> with those guys even close. I'm four <laughs> years behind them. You know, I don't know. Rich Roll, I think he's got a lot more. But I think that's the neatest thing about what you do with this podcast, what they do in, in talking to other people and uh, sharing. Because to me, uh, I think that was one of the questions, you know, what inspires you? Shit, guys like that, man. I, I see that and I, and I want that. You know, uh, and that's and that's something I found out here in Southern California that I find so neat. Rob Lowe, you know, uh, who else? Uh, you know, Robert Downey Jr. And then there's just, you know, the rich roles and, and, and not just, but, you know, Khalil Rafati's. They found their niche, man. Absolutely. And that's what I'm looking to do. And that's why I think it's so important not to give up, even though sometimes I, I feel old and, um, you know, I'm shaking my head. I'm trying to act and I go to auditions and, you know, you're, 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 you know, you're a low man on the totem pole and you're taking skills that you know, but you're revamping them. Then I look at these guys and I see what they've done and that keeps me going. And, you know, that's why we tell stories. <laughs> no question about it. No question about it. So speaking of those closing topics, let's jump in there. Let's get in there because uh, we could we could do this 
this for the next three hours. We could. Yeah, I, I feel the morning. momentum just picking up. Maybe, hey, hey, maybe in the new year we're going to do a show together. You, you, you'll have to do my story junkie. I'll come down to Costa Rica. We're going to be doing these as webisodes. So, uh, oh, man. you know, that would be fun. For sure. <laughs> Done. Done. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Wonderful. All right. So, so Robert, this is what we're going to do. We're gonna, I'm going to ask you some closing questions here for the newcomers. So I'm going to ask you some questions about your early recovery, and I want you to respond with inspiring and insightful answers you can share with our newcomers. Are you ready? Yes, go for it, man. Excellent. Okay, so initially, what was keeping you from getting or staying clean when you first got introduced to recovery? I didn't understand uh, what was required of me, what I needed to do. I didn't understand it was disease. Um, I didn't understand really that, uh, I was powerless over it. And most importantly, I didn't understand. I couldn't do it alone. I couldn't sponsor myself. That was a freaking mess. <laughs> That's it. The, 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 there's one, there's a passage. I can't remember if it's a or NA, but there's one section in here where it talks about doing the, the work in the steps. And this uh-huh. is only one way to work the steps wrong. <laughs> yeah. Alone. Alone. <laughs> Shit. I, you know, I had all those steps. I looked up in the first meeting and I looked through and I was already down to 11. I was ready. I only, I didn't even have to go. I needed just an extra 15 minutes. I would have been done. I didn't have to go back. What an idiot. Oh man. God, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing. We're alive today. Right. Yes, it is. So number two, at what point did you have a spiritual awakening, that aha moment in recovery when you accepted that you were powerless over drugs and alcohol but for the first time had developed the hope that you could recover? When I realized it was a disease and that there really wasn't a rhyme or reason to the things I did or said, uh, that they were you know, bad decisions under the influence of drugs and alcohol. And uh, for, for, I guess, going forward there, it, it took a little bit of the burden away and that I didn't have to carry that. So really to me, the aha moment was, you know, I, I remember it was in uh, Greensboro, is I, it was like, shit, it's a disease. You know, this is like anything else, and there's nothing you could do about it, but you can change it now. And I think, you know, just understanding that this was a disease really, you know, helped me helped me tremendously. I, I guess it took away the, the guilt and the shame a little bit of it, at least. Oh, no question about it. No question about it. You can finally give yourself a break. That's a perfect. Oh, perfect way to say it. Give yourself a break. It's a disease. Now, you know, you, we're guys and, and, and women out there, too, that are like, okay, now what do I do about it? And that's, you know, where we go that's what you go next. Okay, screw this. What do I do next? That's it. Period. End of story. Well, now the journey continues, which in reality is why only one in like 10 of us make it because once you realize what the journey entails, <laughs> it's terrifying. <laughs> I was up at 4.30 this morning at Starbucks waiting for them to open the door. (laughs) Couldn't sleep. Hey, guys, I'm back. Are you okay, Rob? Yeah, I'm fine. All right. (laughs) All right. So, Rob, do you have a favorite book that you would recommend to a newcomer that you read in early recovery? Ah, that's a good question. Uh, Night of the Gun, uh, John Carr, I really like, but that was a journalist. So I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, I think, like, you know, uh, I had Khalil's, Khalil's is pretty good. Okay. Uh, I should be dead. And I think, you know, Rob Lowe did a, a, a fantastic job. Those are just people I could relate to. Um, I saw a thing on Leonard Nimoy, a, um, a, a documentary done by his son, and they talk about it. But I think that, you know, getting your hands out there on, on whatever um, – I don't know, it, again, cliche, but, you know, look around and uh, those people that have written them that you want, go find out. I mean, there's definitely enough high profile people out there, health, fitness, that are in recovery and, and make it appeal to yourself. You know, for me, you know, Rob Lowe, Khalil's book and, um, you know, a couple other ones uh, uh, really, you know, were game changers for me. What's the name of uh, Rob Lowe's book? I knew you were going to ask me that, and I was just going to Google it. It was the first one. It was oh, the let's first. do this together. He's got yeah. Okay, and I'm googling as fast oh, as I can. Lord. It's not the second one, but it's a great story of him with Michael J. Fox waking up in the bed together, uh, high as a kite. Uh, and what was it? Friends I know or something? What was? Uh, oh, hold on a second. Uh, and you know the other guy is Danny Trejo. Uh, I'll probably say that wrong, but he's he's real good too. Rob Danny Lowe. Trejo. Yeah, Trejo. He's got yeah. his tacos out here. And actually, the guys that did the Knievel movie are doing his. Inmate One are doing uh, his life story. Let's see. He's got uh, like, where's... How many years? He's got like 40 years, hasn't he? Like, 49 no. yeah, or that's... something it said. I couldn't believe it. 
And he like, was just it, out signing crazy. autographs at uh, Trey Hill's Tacos. Tacos. Uh, okay, it should have uh, – we got to give Rob his uh, credit where due. Uh, filmography, rewards, uh, personal Love careers. Love my life? That's not it, is it? Stories I Only Tell My Friends, May 2011. Beautiful. That's it. Stories I Only Tell yeah, My Friends. Yeah, I like that. Low. It was really good. And then it's I, – I forget how to pronounce it. It's Khalil uh, Rafati. That's it, Khalil. And that Rafati? was I should I should be I, yes. I should be dead. Exactly. And that's good. I think you can. I know you can get that on Amazon. And hell, if you just uh, um, Google his name, twenty twenty did a great story, and you know they've had uh, international exposure. After the New York Times um, uh, guy went there and had a smoothie, he lives out there or something, and finally told the story. I met Khalil before all this, you know, hit, and uh, I had to laugh because I was like, you know, guy in news. I'm like, he's got a great story. I know he's got a great story. <laughs> <laughs> awesome awesome these are great suggestions all right so then number th- number four what is the best suggestion you have ever received mm, trust the process have faith i mean well and then the second the second part of that would be don't give up yeah absolutely. you can't you, you can't give up i mean like i said this is my journey who would have picked it but if you give up you'll never know what your journey is 100 percent. so then if you could give our newcomers only one suggestion what would that be Trust the process, have faith. Don't give up. Don't give up. You know, it goes back to the, to, to me, those are the things that I remind myself day in and day out when I, uh, stuck on the 405 in traffic and, <laughs> uh, you know, I smile and, you know, I love LA with Randy Newman comes on and I don't give up because I don't know what's around the corner and I can't give up until I keep chasing down every possible, uh, you know, dream, passion and, you know, way to stay sober. Absolutely. A hundred percent. All right. Wow. Rob. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thanks so much, man. And I'm going to send you that hug the cactus. You go find the cactus out there in Costa Rica for me. Absolutely. There's very little cactuses out here. That's for yeah. sure. Rainforest. <laughs> yeah. Tough to find a cactus. Uh, yeah, yeah. But it sure felt like it when I was in, the, in, the, in early recovery, man. I was hugging a lot of cactus. <laughs> I'll bring you to the Joshua Forest when you come back out here, man. And we'll have a smoothie with Khalil. Done. Oh, I can't wait. Oh, this is so exciting. <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks, we have now reached the end of our show. Thanks. Oh, wait a minute. What's the best way for our listeners to reach out to you? Um, I, gosh, you can do it on Facebook, uh, Rob Koble, K-O-E-B-E-L. I'm on Instagram, Rob2237. Uh, website is robkoble.com. Uh, and it's really easy. Gmail is the same thing, robkoble at gmail.com. Uh, you guys are more than you know happy to do that. And I'm on that stuff from time to time. We can't get away from it. Neither can Donald Trump. <laughs> oh god help us <laughs> yeah i won't go there <laughs> yep all right we have now reached the end of our show thanks for joining us <laughs> perfect time to leave <laughs> totally and as we say here in costa rica pura vida pura vida thank you for joining us on the share recovery podcast to check out the show notes page on this interview or to thank our guests for sharing their story Go to www.thesharepodcast.com. While you're on the website, don't forget to sign up for our free newsletter to stay up to date on the latest news, podcasts, and interviews. Want to be one of our guests and share your story? Then go to our website and click on the Share Your Story button. We share our inspiring recovery stories every Tuesday. So subscribe to our show on iTunes or Stitcher Radio to get your free weekly download. We'll see you then. The opinions shared on this show reflect those of the individual speaker and not of any 12-step 